Welcome to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and this is my co-host, Matt. <clears throat> we are here with Dr. Ken Hoven to answer the question, what is the evidence for young earth creation? Donnie and I are um, going to be uh, talking with Ken Hoven because that's a very important question. And Kent is going to be answering that question in the form of a presentation. And after his presentation, Donnie and I are going to be asking Kent several questions on the age of the earth related. Uh, we want this to be a go-to video for all of those that are interested in the amazing evidence for young earth creation, all in under an hour. Awesome. I'm looking forward to this, Kent. How are you doing today, brother? Hey, God's good. Some of God's kids drive me crazy, but God is good. <laughs> Amen. I hear you. You know, before we get started, Kent, did you know that there's people out there who believe they're related to strawberries and mosquitoes? Oh, I debate them all the time. Debated to, uh, related to a potato, <laughs> related to a ladybug. Yeah, yeah. They uh, they really believe it. They do. They do, brother. I think so. And, and we're here favorite. to help them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Kent, we're going to hand it over to you for a presentation on what is the scientific evidence for young earth creation. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you, brother. My name is Kent Hoven. I taught high school science and math 15 years, and I've been a Baptist preacher 49 years, and I believe the Bible is true. As a brand new Christian, as a teenager, I gave my heart to the Lord and started reading my Bible, like you're supposed to if you're saved, and I came across the dates in Genesis chapter 5. It says Adam was 130 when Seth was born, and Seth was 105 when his son was born, and so I made a chart. Uh, didn't make it then. I made it re re more recently, but you can add up the dates in the Bible. They're found in Genesis 5. Adam was 130 when his son was born. And the dates are all given in Genesis 5. After the flood of Noah, the dates are given again in Genesis 11. And you can take it all the way up to Joseph. If you add up the numbers in the Bible, it comes to about 6,000 years old for the age of the earth. Well, I went to high school. I was taught in college first couple of years. I was taught the earth is billions of years old. Somebody's wrong. There's a difference between thousands and billions. Congress doesn't know that, but there is a difference, okay? We, watch, we do a lot of stuff on U Rumble, on YouTube, Genesis Baptist Church channel, and on Odyssey, Ken Hovind Official, our website is drdino.com. Here's to put it in perspective. They're claiming that the Earth is billions of years old. Well, it's about 3,000 miles across America, okay, from California to Boston. Let's let each mile be one and a half million years, each mile. One and a half million years. The timeline shows 4.5 billion years, the supposed age of the Earth. Every foot that you walk across America represents 285 years. It takes 24 years to go one inch. See, these numbers get lost in the human mind. So that's a long walk, right? 3,000 miles. 285 years per foot. It'll take 572 million years to get across South Dakota. When you finally get to Boston, here you are, Boston. Here's a street in Boston where the line ends in 2023. Columbus discovered America in 1492. Jesus died 28 AD. Moses flood about 4,400 years ago. The creation about 4,000 years ago. This all fits going across the crosswalk. These, these lines that they have all the way across billions of years is pure baloney. It's imagination. But they need billions of years for their religion. They say the earth began as a hot ball of rock. Well, that'd be way off our chart, clear back over there in, you know, o o Oregon. So we talk about the age of the earth. The scripture, I believe the scripture is true. And we, our job, one of our Christian's job is to be ready to give an answer. So... How, how do you defend the Bible on scientific aspect or the, science, or the biblical aspect of the age of the earth? Okay, let me get up here if you want to support our ministry. That's all that stuff right here. So we're in Lenox, Alabama. If you want to come visit us straight north of Pensacola, come on down. D-A-L, spelled out with the cars there. Dinosaur Adventure Land. In the beginning. Well, now, wait a minute. When was that? How old is the earth? The evolution religion requires billions of years, and you have to believe the animals can change to a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen a human and a bird being related, but they believe that, and reptiles and ladybugs. This is called imagination. This is propaganda. This is not science. This is a chart that where they drew lines on paper. They got them all related back to a common ancestor. Here, the universe, age of the universe is a topic of debate among astronomers. 
They say it's 13.82 billion years old. Oh, then a couple months ago, they said, no, it's 26.7. They doubled the age of the earth just with one article. Got another 13 billion years. See, the, the pacifier that keeps the atheists from crying is time. If you ask them, how can an amoeba turn to a whale? Well, give it enough time. If that doesn't work, give them more time. That's what keeps them happy. They think time will solve it. Yeah, let's add millions of years. If that doesn't work, add billions of years. That'll solve the problem, billions of years. This whole thing about the age of the earth, I think, is a critical issue that we need to get settled in, settled in on. Jesus said, have you not read? He which made them at the beginning made them male and female. That was the beginning. Adam and Eve. By the way, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Gee whiz, okay. Uh, so Jesus said that was the beginning. Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Jesus said the beginning was when he made Adam and Eve, and he's the one who did it, so he ought to know. And the Bible says nothing died until man sinned. Man brought death into the world. According to evolution, death brought man into the world. Complete opposite, okay? In the beginning, Jesus said that was the beginning. Bible says nothing died till man sinned. Bible says in six days, the Lord made everything. Everything. Six days. And the first man was Adam. And Eve was the mother of all living. I mean, the Bible could not be more clear. If you add up the Bible dates, 130 from Adam to Seth, and then Seth was 105, Enos was 90. You get just add up the dates, make a chart. Put all the numbers together, or buy one of my charts for whatever they are, 10 bucks on the website, uh, and get the dates afterwards. The Bible clearly teaches, after the flood, I mean, the Bible teaches the earth is 6,000 years old. When you look at stalactite formations in caves, cave formations could have all been formed in less than 4,400 years. We cover that on my video number one of my creation seminar series with different scientific ways, and I'll do more detail if you'd like when you come to this, guys. Sorry, baby. Stalactites, you can't have billions of years. Cave formation says only a few thousand. The earth has a magnetic field, but it's getting weaker. Oh, no, there are no magnetic reversals. Don't fall for that one. Get my video number six for more on that. So you can't have magnetic field to help you with your pacifier to believe the Earth is old. Uh, oceans are gaining salt every day. Mineral salts wash into the ocean with the rivers, and the evaporation takes out just the water. 30% uh, salt in some places. They could have gone from fresh water to 3.6% salt, where they are now, in less than 5,000 years. Why aren't the oceans saltier? You can't have ocean salt to pacify, to pacify you. The moon is going around the earth, but the moon's getting further away. The moon's leaving us an inch and a half a year, 1.6 inches. Well, that means it used to be closer. You go back uh, in time, and the moon and earth would snap together. One billion, one billion, 1.4 billion years ago. Why are they saying it's 4.6 billion? The moon says can't be. I'm sorry, you can't have the moon to help you. Human population growth curve shows that our human population started 4,400 years ago when eight people got off of Noah's Ark. But the evolution charts have it going back dead level for 160,000 years? Wait a minute, you, nobody could figure out how to make babies for 160,000 years? Guys, I've seen some real dumb people figure that out, okay? I'm sorry, you can't have the human population. The oldest cities in the world all fit well within the Bible dates, oldest languages, ice cores, and they drill through the ice at North, North Pole and South Pole, and they count ice cores. We cover that in great detail in video number one. Ice cores show less than 5,000 years. Okay? Can't have ice cores to help. Niagara Falls is eroding backwards, breaks the rocks off the edge and moves back. You can see where it was in 1764, then eroded back in 1819, keeps moving back. Erosion of Niagara Falls shows it's less than 4,500 years old. Can't have Niagara Falls. So on my seminar, I cover probably 30 different scientific indicators, the Earth cannot be billions of years old. So if I told you these big ballpoint pens are 5,000 years old, you say it can't be. Big ballpoint wasn't invented until 1888. Big plastic was invented in 1907, and Big became a company in 1945. Well, I think you just clearly proved my claim of 5,000 years is wrong. I don't know when the pen was made, and I don't care, but it's not 5,000. It's less than 1945, okay? If you went scuba diving <clears throat> and you found a treasure chest full of gold coins, and I asked you the simple question, when did it sink? 
You say, I don't know. Well, look at the dates on the coins. The youngest coin in the box is the limiting factor. There might be an older coin in there, but the youngest date is the one you got to go on. That's the limit. It only takes one proof of a young earth to close down the situation on evolution. Case is closed. If you find a coin in there from 1695, another one from 1710, one from the 1750, well, the limiting factor is the youngest coin. Boat sank after 1750. Probably nobody went down in there and put the coins in there after 1710. Okay? That's, that's, it's just common sense logic. I don't know how they don't get it. Takes one proof. He said, Mr. Guy said, Hovind, you don't know science. How can you claim the earth is 6,000 years old when you know ice cores dating? They go back 80, 800,000 years. Well, that led to seminar part four, a distraction I made about how the ice age fits into the Bible. The ice age came at the beginning of the flood. The Bible says, or the, the first law of thermodynamics says, matter can't be created or destroyed. Okay, so how did we get here? How did the earth get here? Well, either two choices. Somebody made the world or the world made itself. Nobody thought of a third choice, except for some lunatics on pot saying, oh, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. Okay, forget those folks. We're here. So evolution believers, nearly all of them, will claim the universe began by itself from a big bang. Nothing exploded and made everything. I think this is real stupid. There's levels of stupid, and this is near the top, okay? 13.772 billion years ago, there was a big bang. They're making these claims that the earth is billions of years old because they need billions of years to turn their frog to a prince. All began with a big bang. How old is the earth? Well, let me skip up to a few things here. There's all sorts of ways to measure things. I mean, man loves to invent things to do measurements, okay? Egyptians did that, a cubit, the palm, the uh, span, a digit, the width of your finger. There's instruments to measure time. There's instruments to measure how heavy things are. Instruments to measure angles, measuring weather. How old is the earth? Well, let's look at some scientific and some historical facts to show the earth cannot be billions of years old. How do we know how old the earth is from live science and national pornographic? Okay, well, somebody made this world or it made itself. Those who believe the world is billions of years old need to explain where did all the stuff come from and why does it violate so many things that we see in nature? So my video number one, I cover all that. Okay, let me back up here. Seminar series. There, oh, right here. There. Bible says, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. Hmm. God said, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So how old is this place? Well, there's a biblical answer and a scientific answer. There are numerous scientific evidences that the earth cannot be billions of years old, and it only takes one. When you find a dinosaur bone, they'll say it's 70 million years old. Oh, did it have a date stamped on it? Did it talk when you dug it out of the ground? Uh, no. So I go through the illustration with the big pins, and it really helps people try to understand. If I claim these are 5,000 years old, you'd say it can't be. History, ballpoint pen invented 1888. Well, that proves my 5,000-year claim wrong, just that one, what, that one fact, okay? Had to be after 88. Sorry, had to be way up here. Proves my, that proves the claim of 5,000 is wrong. Came, breakthrough came in 1907 when invented plastic. Whoa. Well, plastics, pens are made of plastic, so that means it had to be after 1907. Can't be 5,000. BIC didn't become a company until after World War II. History of BIC Corporation. There it is, 1945, outside of Paris. So, guess what? My pens cannot be 5,000 years old. Sorry. Had to be after 1945. So it's easy to prove, disprove the age of the earth also. Now, again, I don't know when the pens were made, nor do I care, but they're after 1945. I promise you that. Has to be. Here they're claiming 4.543 billion years old. Now, that article was back in 2019, so we got to add, what, four, four years onto that? 4.543004. Okay. They're claiming it's old. God said he made the world. He should know. He made the heaven and the earth. And that was the beginning when everything was made. So you asked for some specifics, guys, about the um, some of the things that show the earth cannot be billions of years old. The ice cores are one of the uh, ones. I was in Denver preaching, and I went to the National Ice Core Laboratory, and they took me into the freezer where they, show, they store the giant 
they take a round pipe with teeth on the end of it and drill a pipe, drill a hole down and break a piece off and bring up ice cores. There's the pipe drilled down. Scientific American, an ice coring machine. Okay. <clears throat> they bring up these ice cores and they see there's rings on there. They say, wow, look at these rings. And the, the, th the story they tell is in the summer, it gets warm and it melts. And so it, when it refreezes, it makes clear ice. But in the winter, it just packs the snow down. So that makes a milky layer of ice. So they have milky rings and clear rings, and they're saying they're annual rings. Here's an article in uh, Denver. The 10 ice core samples yanked from a remote Ar Antarctic glacier resting in a giant freezer waiting to be tested. And they look at the rings on there and call them annual rings. Uh, they say snow melts on a warm day and refreezes, making a layer of clear ice on top. It gets compressed with the snow and make a milky layer of ice. In Greenland and Antarctica, where the weather is consistently dry and very cold, the glaciers are miles thick, but the annual rings are thin. There they use the word annual rings. The deepest cores can measure 10,000 feet. Cores from Greenland drilled since 1990 show the northern climate was erratic 135,000 years ago. Really? Yep. They told me the layers represent annual rings. Because in the summer, it melts and makes clear ice. In the winter, it makes packed white ice. And I, I went in and looked at the, you know, I was in the freezer with those guys, had to wear a big heavy suit, a suit to, stay, to stay alive. But sure enough, there's rings on there. This is baloney. Warm and cold days could change that. You can get seven layers in one week. They count these rings, but they keep calling them annual layers. Well, there were some airplanes in World War II called the Lost Squadron. They flew over to join the war, hit a storm, and couldn't land, and tried to get back and ran out of gas, and they landed in Greenland. The 1940, what was the date on the planes? I forget, 1940, early 40s during World War II. Well, some guys got a brilliant idea. Hey, there's brand new airplanes on the ice over there. Let's go get them. So they went over there to try to find the airplanes, and sure enough, they were buried under the snow, way down under the snow. They'd been there 48 years. It's called the Lost Squadron. They were covered by 263 feet of ice in 48 years. They dug, they drilled down to get one out, got it out, took it apart, put it back together in Middleboro, Kentucky. They're flying it in air shows now. Okay, cold mining. They call it the Glacier Girl, the airplane they got off the ice. They talked about these ice rings. Well, they drilled two big holes down and then knocked out the snow and ice between them so they could get the planes up. Took the parts, took it apart, brought the pieces up, put it together in Middleboro, Kentucky. So the airplanes were down there from 1942 to 1990, 48 years, 263 feet down. That's five and a half feet per year. 10,000 feet is the deepest ice core. Divided by five and a half is only 1,800 years. What happened to their millions of years? Deeper ice gets pressed into finer layers because of the pressure on top. So really 4,400 is plenty to allow for all the ice cores. I visited Bob Carden in, at the museum in Middleborough. He's the one who helped dig out and restore the airplane. He said when they got down 62 feet, they had a plywood cover that was left by the 1983 expedition eight years earlier. So the ice accumulated eight feet a year over the top. Ah, I said, Bob, did you go through layers of ice, different layers, dark, light, dark, light? He said, yeah, many hundreds of them. Wait, wait, wait. How can there be many hundreds of layers on top of an airplane that landed 48 years ago? Shouldn't there be like 48? This is the whole point. These guys don't get it, Donnie. Those are not annual layers. This article in Scientific American still calls them annual layers, and they know they're not, okay? Ice cores can be dated counting the annual layers. Dating the ice becomes harder with depth. One way, other ways of ice dating includes ge uh, geochemistry, wiggle, uh, match, matching the ice cores, this, they're not, the ice cores rep, represent a few thousand years. How far back can ice cores be dated? This guy said, Antarctic glaciers, 800,000 years. You are dreaming, okay? No. Ice cores can tell scientists about temperature, precipitation, et cetera. The thickness of each layer allows scientists to determine how much snow fell during a particular year. They're still calling them annual rings, and they're not. Don't fall for this. IceCores.org had one about it. 
Ice cores correspond to years and seasons. We're getting closer. It's a warm spell, cold spell. You can get one of those in one day. It's warm, melts a little layer of ice on top, refreezes clear ice. Still call them annual layers, annual layers. Dating a core. You got to be desperate to date a core. Okay. Australian Antarctic program. Look at that. Ice cores being dated. Annual layers. They are so desperate to make the earth billions of years old because they need billions of years to turn their frog to a prince. Sorry, you can't have billions of years. Here we go. University of Copenhagen. Dating by annual layer counting. Are they deliberately stupid? Are they lying? Do they not understand? Look at the lost squadron, guys. You got hundreds of layers on top of an airplane that landed 42 years ago. Stop, 48 years ago. Stop and think. Stop calling them annual layers. This is pure baloney. Ice core basics. Yep. Look at that. Annual layers. They called it again. See? See? Donnie, I've learned in my experience debating 337 atheists now, ignorance can be fixed, but stupid is forever. This guy sent me a picture. He lives with Alaska, uh, up in Alaska, the North Slope. He said, I got 15 layers of my snow, snow on my car in eight hours. The uh, Inua Indians have 42 or 43 words for snow. Icy snow, so does powdery snow. They don't get it. The Earth's atmosphere has layers. I think there used to be a seventh layer of ice above that. That layer got destroyed when the fountains of the deep broke open. So I think that <clears throat> if no question, our Earth's atmosphere has layers. And if you go up a few miles, six miles or so, it's real cold, like 100 below zero. I believe there was a canopy of ice over the Earth. And that when the, that got shattered, super cold ice is magnetic. So this crystal and canopy would be sucked in and dumped on the North and South Pole. We probably got most of the ice that's at the North and South Pole in one year from when Noah's flood took place. Fountains of the deep broke open, shattered that canopy. That canopy could have been held up by the magnetic field since ice is magnetic or held up by like a big inflatable building or maybe both. Cubic foot of water weighs about 64 pounds. Ice is 10% less than that. So an inch layer of ice weighs five pounds per square foot. So a two-inch layer would be 10, weigh 10 pounds per square foot. Divide that by 144, you get the, how much per square inch you'd have to have. Easily held up by the magnetic field. This ice canopy is probably the explanation for most of the ice at the North and South Pole. Super cold ice is magnetic. It'll, it'll float on top of a magnet and is drawn in by magnetic field. So the ice physics world had an article about that, about mag, uh, magnetic ice. Ice clouds forming. The Bible says... When God made the world, there was water above the firmament. Josephus, uh, he wrote about the time of Christ. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He set the heaven above the universe, surrounding it with ice. That's what Josephus believed 2,000 years ago. Uh, he placed a crystalline firmament. The Jews have taught it was the thickness of this firmament was three fingers, a couple inches, Okay. The thickness of the firmament is two fingers. Oh, this guy said three fingers. This guy said two. Jews argue over everything. I'm sure they split the church and started the church of the two fingers and the church of the three fingers. But the point is, there was a flattened, solid layer of ice above the North and South Pole. Legend of the Jews. On the second day, God brought forth four creations, the firmament, hell, fire, and the angels. The firmament is not the same as the heavens of the first day. It's a crystal stretched over the heads of the Hayat. Hmm and was made to crystallize into a solid. The firmament is not more than three fingers thick. So the Bible says the fountains of the deep were broken open when the flood started. That would have gone up, ripping rocks off the side of the cracks, because the earth cracked up like an eggshell, and shattered that canopy. Being cold, super, being magnetic, it would be drawn in and dumped on the north and south pole. Earth has a magnetic pole, has a, geomet a pole we spin around, but there's also a magnetic north pole. You guys have it up there in Canada, Donnie. And the ice age that we see on the Earth, the effects of the ice age, the glaciers, come further south into America, Kansas City, Missouri, than they do into Russia. The ice age is centered around the magnetic North Pole. Why not the geographic North Pole? Because it's uh, related to Noah's flood, I believe. So here's my theory about the ice layers at the poles. 
6,000 years ago, God made everything in six days. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. The crystal and canopy overhead collapsed and was drawn into the poles by Earth's magnetic field. Scoffers say they're going to be willingly ignorant about that flood. The Bible says, have you not read he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? So that's where it started. That's just one, the ice core. I go with you on my seminar part one, how to prove the earth is not billions of years old with stalactites, oldest written language, the calendar, the salt in the oceans, the magnetic field, the spin of the earth is slowing down, the Sahara Desert is growing, the oil pressure in the ground should have dissipated by now, the moon is leaving us, the sun is burning up, your Niagara Falls is eroding, the oldest tree in the world, ice cores, it all fits what the Bible says. God made everything in six days, about 6,000 years ago. Okay, you asked for a half hour, guys. There you go. I got some specific questions. You want to cover some of these in more detail? Yes, very good. Very thorough, uh, Dr. Hoven. So in light of all of that evidence, I do hear an echo of myself, maybe Joseph. Let me see. Oh, I think we might be good now. Okay, so in light of all that evidence, Kent, that a lot of the critics would simply deny because they will say the existence of dating methods, both carbon dating and other dating methods like potassium argon uh, dating, they'll say demonstrate that the earth is old or at least older than 6,000 years. What's a good way to address this, Ken? Well, none of the dating methods, carbon dating, carbon-14 decays to carbon-12, uh, potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, lead-208, all of the dating methods involve a decay of something, okay? None of them were invented until after World War II. So how did they date these rocks, you know, in 1830 when they started claiming they're billions of years old? Uh, fossils are actually dated by their position in the geologic column. This geologic column was made up in 1830. It does not exist anywhere on the planet except in the textbooks. It's imagination. They claim the top layer is younger than the bottom layer. I say, really, let me ask you guys a question. If the top layer is younger, where did it come from? Outer space? Come on now. How can the layers be different ages? If I shake up one of these uh, sand art toys, I got a bunch here. Let's see. Yeah, here's one. Okay. If you take these things with different colored sand in there and flip it over, in a matter of a few minutes, it'll make 10 or 15 layers of different colors in here. Are the layers different ages? Uh, no, they're all in here at the same time. All the layers are the same age. If you shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger? Uh, no, teacher. They're all the same age. But this teaching of the layers being different ages started in 1830 and is absolutely baloney. I covered that last night on a Genesis Baptist Church channel. You can look at last night's program about uh, Charles Lyell. He's the guy that made all that up, made this stupid geologic column. But all the dating methods, whether it's potassium, argon, rubidium, strontium, lead 208, lead 206, uh, carbon 14, they're all based on some obvious assumptions that you just don't get. Here's an illustration to help you out. If you walked into a room and found a candle burning on a table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know. It was burning when I got here. Well, we got to do some science then. Let's do some empirical science, testable, demonstrable. Let's measure how tall the candle is. So we get out our micrometers and measure it to the nearest bazillionth of an inch. We find out our meter, and you're, for you Canadian folks, we find out that candle is seven inches tall. Okay. When was it lit? Well, that doesn't tell me. I can get very accurately how tall it is but that doesn't help with the, age of, with the age of the candle. So let's measure how fast it burns. We're going to watch it with Olympic stopwatches and get 10 witnesses and video it from 40 angles and charge the, you know, a bunch of money for doing it. And we find out it's burning an inch an hour. Now I've got two facts. It is seven inches tall. It's burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You still can't tell me unless you make some assumptions. How tall was it? Has it always burned at the same rate? You know, a little wind blowing through there would change the rate of burn. If the candle got thinner at the top, it changed the rate of burn. All of these radiometric dating methods, all of them, have the same assumptions built in. You're, you're getting a fossil or a rock, and you're telling, finding how much of a certain element is in it. A potassium decays to argon. We know that. Carbon-14 decays to carbon-12. Uh, lead-208. Lead, no, it's a decay. 
You can measure accurately how much is in it, no question. You can measure accurately how fast it's decaying today, no question. And then you're done with science. Now you got to make some assumptions. None of the dating methods work. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. If I took this clam shell, this cl fossil clam, which is closed, by the way, indicating a buried alive. If I took this to a university and said, how old is this fossil? First question they would ask, where did you find it? What difference would that make? Oh, they're going to date it by the layer it came from. Not with carbon dating, potassium argon dating. The fossils are dated by the layers. Then if you ask them how they dated the layers, they'll say, oh, we date them by the fossils we find. Wait, wait, wait. You date the fossils by the layers, but you date the layers by the fossils. Circular reasoning. Reasoning in a circle. No geologist has ever bothered to think of a good reply. Feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. It cannot be denied from a strictly philosophical standpoint. Geologists are arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks, the fossils. And the relative age of the rocks is determined by the organisms. Encyclopedia Botanica. They knew this 70 years ago. It's circular reasoning. Ever since William Smith, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating. So how are you going to date that rock layer? Carbon dating, potassium argon? No, no, no. They're dated by the fossils they contain, which is based on that stupid geologic column, which does not exist anywhere. This guy said, Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. So there are all these dating methods are based on that geologic column. Here we go. This is from University of North Carolina. More bad news for radiometric dating. It's a real, you can read the article for yourself. They're finding out it doesn't work. Radiometric dating problems with assumptions. Answers in Genesis got a great article on that. There's all kinds of assumptions. Has it been contaminated? How do you know that for millions of years? Radiometric scientists may be aware that bad assumptions and contamination can result in inaccurate radiometric dates. Wow. I agree. Okay. Creation.com had a good article about that. Science Daily, inaccuracies in carbon dating, Cornell University. They're admitting they know it. Radiocarbon dating is a key tool archaeologists use to determine the age of plants and objects made with organic material. But new research shows commonly accepted radiocarbon date standards can miss the mark, calling into question historical timelines. <sighs> See, the Earth's atmosphere is about 300 miles thick. Most of it's within 10 miles. So it contains mostly nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little tiny bit of carbon, and a real tiny amount of carbon-14. Radiation from the sun strikes the atmosphere, and that's what makes carbon-14, radiation from the sun. Then the oxygen combines with the carbon to make CO2. A tiny bit of it is radioactive carbon. Well, CO2, that's what plants breathe. So the plants are always breathing in CO2, and a tiny bit is radioactive. So that radioactive carbon-14 gets into the plant cells. Then when the tree dies, and gets buried, it stops taking, it stops breathing. So it doesn't get any more. So they're really comparing the amount of C14 in the fossil to the amount in the atmosphere to determine how long it's been dead. Willard Libby invented this carbon dating in the early 50s, okay? Carbon dating, it's carbon 14 process, here we go. Um, the radiation from the sun produces 21 pounds of, converts 21 pounds of nitrogen to carbon 14 every year. This is over the earth. How much would 21 pounds be spread out over the whole globe? Not much. Carbon and nitrogen are next to each other on the periodic table. So the carbon-14, normally carbon is carbon-12. and But carbon-14 can be picked up, you can hit, click with a Geiger counter. Same with uranium and other radioactive elements. Carbon-14 is being produced by the sun. It breaks back down to nitrogen. Half of it does every 5,730 years. I agree. During photosynthesis, the plants breathe in CO2. Some of it is radioactive. Okay, I agree. No problem. 
Animals eat the plants and make it part of their body. I bet during your lifetime, you've either eaten some plants or you've eaten some animals that have eaten some plants. I bet, I bet you've done that, okay? So you probably got radioactive carbon in you. I do too. So when the plant dies, it stops breathing in CO2. So it's assumed the ratio in the radioactive C14 to normal C12 in the atmosphere would be the same found in living plants and animals. Atmosphere has got 0.0000765%. Well, maybe the plants and animals do too. When it dies, it stops eating. Tough taking any more. So what they're really doing with all these data, with carbon dating anyway, they're comparing the amount in the fossil with the amount in the atmosphere. And if the fossil's only got half as much as the atmosphere does, they'll say it's been dead for 5,730 years. Huh, okay. It can't get any more. So if it gets, gives them this number, it's freshly killed, zero years old. If they get that amount or that amount or that amount, they're just determining the age by the percentage of C14. It goes from a half to a fourth to an eighth to a sixteenth. Calibration curve used for carbon dating. You got 16, you got eight. Oh, it's only 5,700 years old. So they're dating how they're comparing the amount in the atmosphere to the amount in the fossil. What if the amount in the atmosphere has changed over the years? Now you got a rubber ruler here, don't you? With their short 5,700 year half-life, no carbon-14 atom should exist in any carbon older than 250,000 years, like coal. Yet it's proven impossible to find any natural source of carbon that does not contain significant amounts of C14. Huh. They've been unable to figure it out. The world's best laboratory learned during two decades of low C14 measurements how to not contaminate specimens. Let's see. The constitute strong evidence the Earth is only a few thousand years old. ICR has a great article on that. Here's the assumptions. If I told you to fill a barrel with water, okay, but I've drilled holes in the barrel. As you put water in, it starts leaking out. At some point, you're going to reach a stage we call equilibrium. It's leaking at the same speed you're adding it. So the question is, sunlight is putting carbon-14 in, and it's decaying, leaking out, like the barrel here. So how long would it take for the Earth to reach equilibrium? One assumption is that global levels of carbon-14, the atmosphere has not changed over time. The other assumption is the corollary of the first. The biosphere has the same overall concentration due to equilibrium. Well, has it reached equilibrium? Uh, no. Radiocarbon dating is a key tool. But it has to, Science Daily did an article on that a couple of years ago. Freshwater reservoir effect. I, I recommend you get my video number seven where I cover this in greater detail without having to go so fast. But carbon dating, all of them are based on the obvious assumptions. Has Do we know the decay rate hasn't changed? Has there been any contamination? Has it reached equilibrium? You simply cannot know those things, Donnie. Okay, those are all wild guesses. I can show you examples where it doesn't give the right age, but then the evolutionists, they don't buy that. They're missing the much bigger picture of the fundamental assumptions underlying the carbon dating. Okay, I'm sorry, too long. One more question. <laughs> no, that was great. That was nice and thorough for sure. Well, you know, that is one of the most popular questions that ever comes up for the age of the earth. And so the next one is probably the most important one would be what about distant starlight? Does the existence of stars being billions of light years away mean that the universe itself is also billions of years old? Well, God could have created it yesterday with the stars billions of year, light years. See, a light year is not a time. It's a distance. Hmm. A light year is a di how far does light go in one year? It goes 186,282.4 something miles per second. But how far does it go in a year? Well, a whole bunch, okay? So a light year is a distance. It's not a time. The Bible says 17 times God stretched out the heavens. I believe he made the earth first. Then he made the stars a couple of days later, and he stretched them out into place. So they probably are billions of light years away. I don't argue they're not. I'm just saying it had nothing to do with time. There's a lot of stars out there. God claims he made the heavens. Uh, I skip some of this for time here, and supernovas and all that stuff. But as far as the distance to the stars, uh, supernova, this is all on video number seven. Star bursts, star deaths. There should be a new star forming. It should be nine million new stars forming every year, every minute. We don't ever, nobody's ever seen one form. Stars evolve, the death should equal, birth should equal deaths. We've seen them blow up. We've never seen a star form. So they're, they're, they're dreaming about all this. 
We don't know how a single star managed to form. They didn't know it 40 years ago, and they still don't know it today. Okay, They have some theories they talk about. So here we go. Let me get up. No one understands star formation. The Bible says God made the stars on day four. He made the earth on day one. And he counts the number of the stars. He doesn't, it doesn't mean he knows how many. Each star has a number. God can look at each star and say, oh, your star number, you know, ABC. Uh, stars, in heaven, the waters that be above the heaven. Let me skip all that for you. So uh, Hubble Telescope and other telescopes, they, they looked at a spot above the Big Dipper. They thought there was nothing there. If you took a grain of sand and held it at arm's length, that's the size of the spot they were looking at. They kept looking at that continuous viewing of that spot where they thought there was nothing, took a bunch of pictures and said, man, there's more stars in there than we, than we can count. That's new ones we didn't know about. Stars are so far away, they appear to be pinpoints of light. Here's the problem with measuring star distance. I taught trigonometry for years. If you have to, to get a calculated unknown distance, you have to have two observation points and know the angles, and you can use simple trigonometry, sine, cosine, tangent, okay? If you looked at a building seen from the left eye and then the right eye, you notice it appears to shift over. So with a little mathematics, you could calculate the distance to a building if you knew the, if measure the angles accurately. Yeah, I understand. Uh, that guy's been doing it too long. Earth is about 8,000 miles in diameter, okay? Well, if you're on opposite sides of the Earth looking at a star, you're making a triangle, two observers pointing to one star, all right? Well, that doesn't give you much of an angle. So they try to make it bigger, the, the base of the triangle. 93 million miles is the distance to the sun. Uh, that's eight light minutes from the sun to the Earth, eight light minutes. So the diameter of our orbit is 16 light minutes. One year has 525,000 minutes in it. So if you let that little circle be the Earth's orbit around the sun, this is not Earth's diameter, this is the orbit. Call it 16 inches instead of 16 light minutes. We're gonna try to measure 525,000 inches. That's eight miles. That's the triangle problem you get with one light year. Do you think you can accurately measure the angles? How do you know exactly where you were six months ago? I mean, how close, how, how close can that be? Since not only are we going around the sun, the sun's moving around the galaxy. Now you really got a mathematical problem. Earth's orbit around the sun, 16 light minutes. One light year triangle, one light year, would have an angle of 0 0.017 degrees. And that's assuming you know your exact location six months ago on opposite sides of the sun. I think the whole thing is baloney. If you had two surveyors 16 inches apart and moved the third dot, you don't know how far it is. They don't know. They're supposed to figure it. But it's 830 miles away. Tell you what, get two guys on the roof in Pensacola to look at a dot in Chicago. They're 16 inches apart focusing on a dot. All they know is their distance between themselves and how far out of parallel their, their telescopes are. That's the problem with measuring these distances. That's insane to say you can measure 15 billion light years. Now, the stars might be that far away. I'm not arguing they're not. I'm saying we don't know. We can't tell. Limitations of distance measurements. 0 0.01 arc second, very difficult to measure from Earth. You also got the Earth's atmosphere interfering with atmospheric twinkle. So they're saying you can measure 326 light years. All right, I'll give them 350 light years. You can't measure billions. So then they try to use parallax trigonometry. Let's get a, get an angle, to, get the distance to a close one, and then use parallax to go further than that. It's still the same problem, much worse problem. I can get up here. Okay. This textbook says they can measure 100 light years. All right, I'll give them 100. 20, 2021, using parallax trigonometry, they got to where they could measure out, uh, let's see, star distance, very distant stars. Um, downloaded a couple of years ago. I think they're now claiming they can measure uh, 500 light years, I think is the number they're using. Well, why are we claiming these stars are billions of light years away? Donnie, I'm not saying they're not, they could be, but it doesn't matter. Plus it's the obvious assumption if God stretched out the heavens, 
He could have made him yesterday and stretched him out to that distance. And they could be that far away, which has nothing to do with time. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. Okay. I think when we look at the universe, we should say, wow, God, you're amazing. I don't have a problem worshiping him. Not a problem at all. Okay, next question. Amen, brother. This is what we need. Good, comprehensive answers to these common questions, Dr. Hoven. So I appreciate it. So the next common question that comes in, age of the earth related, and I'll put it up on the screen for people to see. Now that we've dealt with dating methods, distant starlight, Kent, you did an excellent job dealing with ice core dating during your presentation. So we don't need to uh, go over that one again. So this one, does tree ring dating refute a young earth? Oldest tree. Here is the oldest tree in the world, the Methuselah tree. Still growing. Barely hanging in there. We've got a log of a bristlecone pine in our science center that's got 700 rings. Bristlecone pine, which is what the Methuselah tree is, grow very slow. This is a log we've got from uh, 30 inches, 700 rings in it. Tree ring dating is not an exact science. Trees often produce more than one ring a year. They're actually measuring the seasons, rainy season, dry season. What if you had a rainy spring, a dry summer, and a rainy fall? You're going to get two rings. Hmm. Occasionally, trees produce more than one ring in a year. Extra ring, called a false ring, can be the result of drought stress in the middle of a growing season. Huh. Evidence for multiple ring growth per year in bristlecone pine. Article in creation.com about that. Multiple ring growth per year. Let's see. Might interest you to know, trees go back at least 8,000 years without being disturbed by Noah's flood. Oh, they're trying to say the flood is wrong, okay? Uh, that's the secular web trying to prove it. Young Earth Proof 27, the oldest tree, 4,300 years old. It said, this guy, we go back 8,000 years. Oh, really? Okay. Different locations on the mountain affect tree wreath, tree growth. Uh, if a tree is growing on one side of a mountain where it gets lots of rain, and on the other side it doesn't get any rain, two trees on the opposite side of the same mountain will have different ring patterns. Really? So they match up overlapping tree rings of living and dead bristlecone pine. Wait a minute. You drill, you drill into the tree and you get a ring sample and you overlap that with a dead tree. What, what if your dead trees across the mountain got a different ring you know, on the other side of the mountain? Uh, the annual tree ring, such thing, these things can affect the growth. Rainfall, floods, glacial activity, atmospheric pressure, volcanic activity, variations in nearby stream flows show up in the rings. Mm. We could add disease and ac excessive activity by pests. We had to take down about 30 trees on our property because of the stupid pine bark beetles. They can hurt it. So what they do, they overlap tree rings from a living tree, from a dead tree, and from a uh, maybe a, a piece of wood off a building or something, from a log from the ruins. This is how they get the dates to stretch back further. I think in a court of law, any judge would throw all that out. Say, look, that's not science. You don't know that measuring the same thing. Rain shadow. Trees on the rainy side have different ring patterns than trees on the leeward side. Hmm. Here's things that can affect tree ring growth patterns. The rain shadow, the prevailing wind, the rain uh, patterns, different growth rates of trees growing near each other. What if there's a tall tree growing on uh, the one under it doesn't get the sunlight? The big one gets the sunlight. Then the big one dies. Now the little one gets it and it grows faster just simply by overshadowed with another tree. How would you know that when you found a log? Prevailing wind, rain patterns, could different growth rates in trees each year. Disease. One area of the forest might be diseased right beside a tree that's disease free. Um, trees that grow near each other can have different growth ring patterns. One tree can be overshadowed, like I mentioned a minute ago. Good soil versus bad soil. Same plant, same genetics, different soil. Well, the growth rate's going to be different. Soil conditions can vary next door, causing different growth patterns. The general Sherman tree was thought to be five to 6,000 years old. They tested it and said it's only 2,000 years old. Well, what happened? 2,000-year-old general Sherman tree. Huh. 
middle age giant sequoia. Other trees are believed to be 3,200 years old. Well, where's the million year old trees? General Grant moved up a place in the giant sequoia size when the Washington tree lost the hollow upper half of its trunk after a fire. Once thought to be 2,000 years old, recent estimates suggest the General Sherman Grant tree is closer to 1,600. No big deal, take off 350 years, just like that. So I think the tree ring dating, is they're, they're, they're whistling in the dark, trying to scare off the bad guys. The Methuselah tree, oldest non-clonal organism, while Methuselah stands as of 2016 as the ripe old age of 4,800, uh, another bristlecone pine was discovered to be over 5,000. Well, again, you're back to the problem of the variations with all the things that cause variations. But that's not millions. And the Bible says there was a flood 4,400 years ago. Some trees might have survived the flood. Some trees might have been ripped out, redeposited after the flood. Floods do that all the time. 4,300-year-old bristlecone pine, Earth's oldest organism. Okay. Why not 50,000? My point would be, the oldest individual trees, 4,800, which is 4,800 rings, okay? You don't know it's years old. That fits fine with the Bible. Even 5,000 would fit fine with the Bible because they're not years, they're rings. Methuselah tree could be 5,000 years old. So I cover plenty on that. Why isn't there a tree with 100,000 rings? God made everything 6,000 years ago, 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. And tree rings... Trees can survive a flood or be uprooted and redeposited. So to say they're millions of years old is absolute insanity. Cannot be. Okay. Any questions, brother? Uh, yeah, we've got one more. Um, this one is for a young earth creationist. How would we address the ordering of the fossil record? Doesn't the order of the fossils in the rock stratum mean that the earth must be old? Because, um, the order is used to explain how organisms went from the bottom layers that are more primitive to more complex organisms such as humans in the higher levels. You covered that briefly a little bit earlier, but that is a major hiccup for the evolutionists. Okay, I'm trying to find it at the same time. The ordering of the fossils. They will say, and I've got slides I could use for this if I could find it quickly. They will say clams are generally at the bottom of their so-called geologic column. I agree. And uh, birds are generally at the top. I agree. And they say, doesn't that prove that the clams evolved to birds? Uh, no. See, clams might be at the bottom. I'll get my slides up here just a second here. Uh, see, I, I do my, it helps when you have, ask the questions in the same order. I've got my slides. Uh, let me go to, uh, fine, here it is. The clams might be at the bottom of the so-called geologic column, which does not exist anywhere, because clams are already at the bottom when the flood starts. Wouldn't they be the first ones buried? I mean, that's where they live. The flood water racing around mudslides would bury the clam beds, and they're, they're found, found petrified closed. Interesting. Hmm. Clam, clams open when they die. What happened here? It didn't open. There. There. Um, Maybe birds are found on top because birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. So they might be sorted based upon their habitat. These are already at the bottom. That's why they're there. On the, in the, now, they're not always in the order they show them in the geologic column. But there could be a, a different reason than one evolving into the rest. Let's see. Uh, fossil record, geologic column. It's on here somewhere. Uh, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are fossils, but they're not a record. Oh, here we go. Maybe it's in here. They could also be sorted based upon their uh, their intelligence. As far as we know, clams aren't too smart. Okay, They could be sorted based upon their mobility. You know, clams can't run very fast. They could be sorted based upon their body density. Uh, clam feathers are, or clam shells are heavier than bird feathers. So there's other reasons to, to claim there's, if there's any sorting at all, it could be a density situation. Why do these things, when you flip them over, why do they make different layers? Right. It's the dens density of the sand. It's got nothing to do with anything else. So I'm sorry, I can't find it now, but I do have a picture just showing that, what I just said, for other reasons why they may be sorted. Okay? So technically, you don't need 
billions of years to explain the so-called ordering in the fossil record. Well, first, I don't think there is a, a strict order to the fossil. There's no right. such thing as a fossil record. Uh, and they're certainly not always in that order. If you found a clam on top, they would have a, like clams like this are found on top of Mount Everest. You can't get any higher than that. They'll have an explanation for it, you know, overthrusting or something like that. Rather than say, man, maybe my theory's wrong, they will dance around the tree to try to find a way to make it fit their theory. You, right. you can't, you know, don't expect them to give in on that one. So, okay, you've done an excellent job. I have a bonus question. You made some fantastic points on the ice canopy. And I was wondering what your thoughts were <clears throat> on the objection to, to those that like to reject the ice canopy. They'll say that this solid layer or strip of ice would make it almost impossible to see the stars in the pre-flood world. Do you have a, any thoughts on that or have you heard that before? Well, if it was a couple fingers thick and super cold, 400 below zero and crystal clear, it actually you can see the stars better right? because it would compress our atmosphere down. Right now we get what's called atmospheric twinkle because you look at the stars and the, you know, the air is moving around and things are affecting. The, so they, they want to get a, a telescope outside of our atmosphere, like the Hubble telescope flying around to eliminate the atmospheric twinkle. So, no, I think a canopy overhead would actually enhance the ability mm -hmm to see the stars, they'd be much more clear. Right, right. so it's not really a, a bug of the <clears throat> ice canopy model, it's a feature. You'd be able to see right. the stars better. And then the other major objection is people will say if there's this layer of ice around the earth that uh, there'd be regulation problems on the earth. There'd be but maybe too much heat or it'd be too warm for life on the planet. Or, or, any thoughts on that, Kent? Well, if you start with the assumption that God designed it all, he thought of everything, okay? If the earth indeed had a canopy of ice overhead, which I strongly believe it did, now it's now gone, I think that's where the ice age came from, from that super cold ice being dumped, which is why the animals are found frozen around the North Pole area, standing up, food still in their teeth, and they died of suffocation, like a rapid snowfall. 20 or 30 feet of snow probably fell in, you know, 10 minutes when this ice canopy, and it was 400 below zero snow. So that would fall quickly and start plowing its way out as you know as it builds up deep enough, it starts avalanching out, leaving behind drumlins and terminal moraines. And I think the whole ice age can be explained by that. The canopy though, would increase the uh, air pressure. And there's a thing called tidal pumping. Let's say here's the moon up here. Ah, here's the moon uh, and it's holding a tide of water up right now. But it would also hold the canopy back and forth. It would, as the earth is spinning, the tide, you'd have a, an air tide, actually, with this canopy going up and down maybe a few a few miles, I don't know, in, in relation to the earth. So it's holding that, and that's pumping the air around. You get constant, I believe they had constant breeze circulation, nice gentle breeze, perfect temperature everywhere. Um, and if this outer, outer space is minus 459.6, roughly, absolute zero Fahrenheit, minus 273 Kelvin, or 273 Fahrenheit, Celsius, zero Kelvin. So this, this ice canopy might itself have regulated the temperature of the atmosphere. If it was 10 miles up and was minus 459, that might translate to you know 70 degrees at the surface. But again, that's a minor problem compared to the atheist problem of everything, the whole Earth coming from a dot smaller than a proton. <laughs> right. Amen. Well said. Those are the two main objections that I've seen, and I think you addressed them thoroughly. So very good, Kent. We did hit the hour mark. <clears throat> I think the next one we should do will be the flood, and then we can ask you some flood-related questions. We'll make this an entire series of roughly hour-long videos, and then uh, in the future, Matt and I can condense them into a, a DVD set. So Kent, Sounds excellent good. job, <laughs> excellent job uh, tonight, my brother. Any final words or final thoughts before we let you go get ready for your nightly Bible study? Well, more important than having all the scientific facts and everything about the creation is where do you go when you die? Hmm. You can be right on everything and know all about science and creation and still die and go to hell. So I'd say, are you going to heaven? Jesus did all this, created everything, and he wants to see, he wants you to come to heaven. So if almost 55 years ago now, I prayed and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please save me? And boy, he did. And he's still working on me. But uh, 
He's inside. I'd encourage everybody, make sure you're going to heaven. That's more important than getting all the science facts down. Okay? Amen. Nothing more important than where are you going to spend eternity? So great final words, Kent. Yeah, the, Matt and I, we're going to let you all right. get Sounds ready good. for your Bible study. And we'll Thank talk soon. God bless. Okay, Matt, we will just spend a couple minutes <clears throat> uh, summarizing here. And okay, I think that was an excellent first. I'm just trying to find. There we go. A two person template. So <laughs> that was an excellent uh, first video or seminar in our new series here. What is the evidence for young earth creation? Kent did an excellent job as always. I appreciate the visuals, the thorough answers. And I also like the way that he <clears throat> breaks down these technical topics and questions in an easy to understand way for people. So, and that's what we want to do for our audience is we want to give people uh, shorter videos on comprehensive topics. And so they can uh, share it around to their family, their friends, and make it as a go-to video for these topics. So the next one we'll do is the flood with Kent. And then we'll do one on lies in the textbook. So we'll probably have to do a couple on lies in the, in the textbooks. And so that'll cover the evidence for evolution. And it'll probably be a roughly five, five part series. Maybe we'll do an episode five <clears throat> strictly on answering questions and challenges that people uh, have pertaining to the issue. So I made a couple notes, Matt, and I'd be curious as to your thoughts. Kent mentioned the fact that carbon decays so quickly, so rapidly, that if every single atom in the universe were made of carbon, it would all literally decay within a million years. But yet we find C14 specifically in samples all throughout the so-called geologic column rock strata, whether it's coal, whether it's uh, diamonds, for example, diamonds, they're claimed to be billions of years old and they're the hardest substance on the planet. And so they should be the most resistant to contamination. They're shielded from the cosmic ray bombardment that's taking place in the atmosphere. And so when we examine or analyze diamonds, there should be no carbon-14 present at all in these samples. And guess what, Matt? We've analyzed them repeatedly, and there are measurable amounts of carbon-14 in them. And this provides, in my opinion, irrefutable evidence against an Earth that is supposedly billions of years old because the C-14 found in these diamonds, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, shouldn't that be intrinsic to the diamonds themselves? Right. When we're looking for um, pretty much uh, carbon in anything, the first thing they want to do is say, well, it's contaminated. But that's the thing about diamonds is it's not contaminated because if anything, it has trouble escaping the diamond, which the critic tries to say, well, that's why it's still there because it leaches out slowly. But the problem with that is when the pressure increases and the heat increases, it leaches out quicker. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's the, how are the diamonds created with heat and pressure? What are they doing down there? There's not much carbon. So <laughs> what's the carbon doing there? So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I think one of the biggest problems with that the critic doesn't really consider is what Kent was saying. You walked into a room and you see a, um, a candle burning. When did it start? Well, now I always say we, we can see these things now from the Proton 21 laboratories in Ukraine. And when they react and they create these radioactive elements, do they form as though they would have existed hundreds of millions or billions of years ago, like they say these things are? And they don't. They create them in the same ratios and proportions that they are on Earth today. So I think that's the death blow to all radiometric dating dates. So that's my take on it. Amen. Well said, great points. It, you know, the evolutionists, they claim to love science. <clears throat> they claim to have engaged with the data. And yet, as you've pointed out, their rescue devices to this reality of finding C14, detectable levels of C14, all throughout the rock strata, 
have been addressed. When it comes to contamination that you mentioned, the laboratory applies extremely strict pretreatment protocols that involves harsh washings, that is repeated harsh washings in strong acid to the point where these acids, Matt, would literally dissolve anything. And these samples are hit with multiple treatments that ensure only carbon intrinsic to the sample ends up being in the instrument to be measured. And so these samples can't be contaminated. They're not contaminated uh, from the atmosphere either. And these samples of, of coal, fossils, including fossilized wood and diamonds all have detectable levels of radiocarbon in them. And so what are the critics left with, Matt, on this issue? How do they address it? Well, they they always have some type of rescue device. Uh, what I would imagine that the critic would say uh, towards us being young earth creationists is how come carbon dating does give dates older than 6,000 years old then? Right. And we could answer that with the mere fact that, well, we say that God created the heavens and the earth. And in those six days, he created earth to be inhabited. We know that when we look back into the, into the past, we find that things were bigger. There was more carbon in the atmosphere, more oxygen. We find that there was more of those things. That's why even plants grew larger. So then we have a global flood. Well, what happens during a flood is we have worldwide volcanism. What is What do volcanoes produce? Lots and lots of carbon, right. a lot more than natural. So the uniformitarianism says, oh, well, how things are today is how they are in the past. Well, not if there was a catastrophic event. They believe in catastrophe. They just don't like to admit it. They believe that an asteroid destroyed the dinosaurs. We just believe that it was a global flood that did it. Ours would pump massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, increasing the amount of carbon that we see in things, giving older dates. Hmm. So basically, the further we go back to, let's say, the flood, the older ages you're going to get than the true ages, right? And yeah, so, we would start having a problem probably around, you know, 4,000 years and back because remember, it started the Ice Age. Right. So we have lots of carbon in the atmosphere mm -hmm. worldwide, blocking out the sun, starting the Ice Age. And then after that, carbon starts to neutralize, come back down and hits equilibrium. And then we get what we can date and it becomes so, more accurate. So if you were to dig something up that was buried in the flood <clears throat> and then dated it, you would get something like 50,000 years rather than 5,000 years. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Much, much higher uh, levels because it was around during that time. So if we were to find Noah's Ark, I would imagine that it itself would carbon date all over the place. It would be drastically different because it literally survived the flood where it was made pre-flood as well. So then it went through that and was around volcanism and then it wasn't buried. So what happened to it? It just laid there on the surface, got reused, corroded, got buried. We don't know. Yeah. So basically, the further we go back, the more carbon dating would need to be calibrated. Since right. the, the flood, as you're pointing out, <clears throat> would have changed a lot. It buries all the carbon in the environment. The C-14 has been increasing in the atmosphere, most likely since creation. We know the magnetic field is decaying. Uh, Kent talked about that. It's decaying consistently, which limits the age of the earth. And that means it was a lot stronger in the past, which would disrupt or change cosmic ray bombardment in the atmosphere. That's and, right. And so the point is, or the question I should ask you, rather than being an enemy of young earth creation, Matt, carbon dating is a friend. Oh, absolutely. Um, that's why we find it in dinosaur bones. Why would dinosaur bones have uh, carbon right. inside of them as well? All right. These things are supposed to be the last existing dinosaur around 65 million years. So what are they doing with 50,000 year maximum radioactive elements inside of them? They have to say contamination. But yet again, that's a rescue device because we find that they are now calibrating for that and saying, well, there's no contamination anymore. So it's just rescue device after rescue device. You know, that the thing is they need to take out of their mind is what if it's not uniformitarianism? Can we add catastrophism and still get these same results? And you just do. I mean, we can easily account for the uh, ice core layers. Um, think about what ice does as well, right? It it floats as well. You get um, uh, you get uh, glaciers and these things would be, they can form quickly. They can also melt quickly. So we have different fluctuations of sea levels. There's so many different factors to take into play. And that's why you wrote a book 
the rescue device handbook, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was removed, by the way. Amazon uh, must have got it petitioned a little too much on that one, by the way. Right, they, taken out. the critics don't like when we call out the rescue devices. No, no, they do not like that. Um, but it is what it is, and we call things like they are because we're standing for truth. Right. So if if you don't want it to be, if you don't want us to say those terms, then uh, come up with another term for us to use because that really is all that they are. You know, um, when you don't have evidence for something, you just make it up and just say it. That's not evidence. It's post hoc ad hoc. Rather, they're retrofitting the data <clears throat> into their model rather than coming to the more plausible conclusion based on the data. Like they have claimed, I uh, Dr. Hugh Ross versus Dr. Jason Lyle, his main argument to this, and Dr. Lyle demolished it, was, well, there's other nuclear material down where the diamonds are, deep within the earth, that can essentially recharge the C-14. But the problem is for the old earther, the rate team, made up of PhD scientists, they looked into this argument and they estimated that you would need thousands, about 13,000 times more nuclear material in the nearby rocks to these diamonds in order to adequately recharge the C-14. And so that's far too much material to recharge. It's unrealistic. D deep down in the earth, we know these cosmic rays cannot reach uh, deep within the earth. And so the C-14 would just decay away. And so the point is their best rescue mechanisms on this issue, Matt, they've been looked at, they've been examined, and they've been systematically demolished. This is a challenge they've yet to answer. Right. And I believe that we can answer it because you see, when you look at these, uh, let's say zircon crystals, right? They're the perfect example because they say and claim that they're the oldest element that we can find on Earth to radiometrically date. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Yes, they contain uranium, which is very, very old according to evolution. And, but they also contain things that are very young. Young uh, Helium would be a perfect example. What's helium still doing them? And, and argon. These are gases that naturally escape. So we have things inside of them that are young, but at the same time, they're giving old dates. So you can't have, again, your cake and eat it too. You have to be able to answer both of them. We can, because again, when we go back to the proton laboratories in Ukraine and they make radioactive elements, they form more daughter isotope than parent isotopes. But these daughter isotopes decay rather fast. So when they're decaying rapidly, what's being formed? Helium, argon. So you, you have these things that are right here and they're trapped and they have young dates to them. Um, and we can explain that the evolutionists cannot. They That's why they invoke contamination or that something else caused it to happen. They don't, of course, uh, uh, young earth creationists would have to invoke most of the time accelerated nuclear decay. We don't have to now, but that is one of the answers of why there's so much helium and argon in them from during the right. flood. Right. Well, that's an excellent point you brought up, Matt. <clears throat> if these crystals, these zircon crystals you're talking about really were a billion or more years old, most of that helium being such a slippery molecule, right? As you're saying, yes, should sir. have escaped, should have slipped out. Right. But if these crystals only go back thousands of years, then most of the helium should still be present. And from my understanding, these are predictions made before the analyses came through on, on these crystals. And when the data was received, they discovered helium in quantities that are fully in line with uh, young earth creation or uh, rapid nuclear decay if you're a creationist that holds to to that model that's right and the cool thing about that too is that was discovered and published in the secular journals it wasn't some young earth creationist that was like oh we're gonna go do our own studies and find these things they it was published already so that's the amazing thing about it and so right. the young earth creationists tried to explain it and they said it must have happened probably in the biblical year of the flood where accelerated nuclear decay was very high and you and i of course now we just go well no it doesn't have to be accelerated nuclear decay in one year uh we can actually witness this through experimental things where we watch these radioactive elements form in a very proportional manner to how they exist today so if that's the case you can't you can't get hundreds of uh, millions of years or let alone billion. So uh, that's the real uh, 
killer right there for radiometric dating. Well, and this goes back to the uh, radiocarbon in diamonds too, because since the rate results, these results were confirmed in, from my understanding, the UC Riverside Radiocarbon Lab. Dr. Andrew Snelling gave a lecture on this, and he talks about how eight diamonds yielded radiocarbon ages from 64,000 years, roughly, to 80,000 years. A ninth diamond was taken and cut into six equal fragments and yielded radiocarbon ages from 69,400 years to 70,600 years. And so the carbon-14 was evenly distributed and intrinsic to the diamond. It's not due to contamination. The results have been confirmed uh, by secular scientists. And so critics that argue against these results or deny these results, Matt, they're just out of date on the data. They're out of date on the literature, my brother. That's right. And uh, what do they do to resolve this? Just add more time. They just right. keep pushing things back and being older and saying, well, we'll figure out the answer one day. And, you know, time's not saving them in these things. It's just it's just prolonging their slow death as a model and a theory. Right. And so so the last thing I'll say, <clears throat> this has been an excellent show. I'm looking forward to part two. And I think this has been a good uh, summary. We've also elaborated on a few things, refuted some of the critics main objections to what we're saying. And they don't withstand scrutiny. We haven't even focused on the biological and genetic data that we specialize in, Matt, that also confirms a young Earth. Mutation accumulation, the fact that there's too few DNA differences in the mitochondrial DNA, too few DNA differences in the Y chromosome. You know, if we go back thousands of years, let's just say to out of Africa 200,000 years ago, we should find a lot more DNA diversity, a lot more mutations should have accumulated. And the fact that the mutation rate is so high, most mutations are deleterious. This puts shelf lives on genomes. And so if species cannot persist for millions of years into the future, Matt, what does that mean about the past? Well, they could not have persisted for millions of years into the past. And this also sets an age limit on the earth through genetics, because this demonstrates that biology is young, brother, but biology is reflected all throughout the so-called geological column. And that means biology in the rock strata is also young. And so the rock strata itself that contains these fossils of biological organisms is what? Young. Young. That's right. Yeah, uh, Ken just gave a list as fast as he could talk about all the different things that show how young the earth is. So another thing to be talking to the critic would be how come 90% of all of the different things to date the age of the earth show that it's young, but you want to hang on to the two, the radiometric dating and the distant starlight as your only options left for it being old. When we easily can explain away those things that match more what our model would predict to begin with. Right. So it doesn't make much sense to hold and grasp on so desperately to something unless you really want to. And we've come to, to uh, the knowledge that the people that we talk to, that are the critics, really have some reason that they're doing evolution. They're, there's some type of either monetary gain, popularity, friendship, something bound to why they're doing it. They really want to hold on to, uh, to that, you know, um, sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> so I just I find it a shame that people would rather just do that than go where it's supposed to lead. But then again, they they you know they don't want to be in that realm of the conspiracy that's what they still consider this right until it's right. valid and most people are going to believe it they don't want to have anything to do with it but for christians we don't really we shouldn't be caring about that and the main reason why is because it says that the earth is the people aren't going to like us anyway right so right. we're not trying to uh, uh make friends of of the, the god we're not trying to overturn the secular system we exactly. understand the world's going to get worse before it gets better, before the return of Jesus Christ. And so we're here to win souls. And that's why it's not always about winning arguments. It's, it's about winning souls. It's about the gospel. It's about the truth. And my brother, that's why we stand for truth. And so, okay, great, uh, great final points. This has been excellent. I want the audience to please share this around as 
a or one of many go-to videos for the scientific evidence for young earth creation stay tuned for our second part hopefully we'll be focusing on the flood so god god bless matt great work to dr dino god bless you as well excellent presentation and just a very thorough uh video here i'm very happy with it so with that uh, god bless everybody and donnie and matt are out <laughs>